I teach um, popular literature at Christopher Newport University. Um, I wrote my dissertation on uh, Lovecraft, Howard, and Smith, um, and um, I have a book coming out based on that. Um, it's it's in press. It just needs to. Uh, I need to get the proof copies and index it, but um, yeah, it should be coming out here soon. Um, my paper is called um, Conan the Compassionate: Red Nails and the Dehumanizing Stalemate War. I'm probably going to go over for fi over 15 minutes, but I'll well, I'll set it for. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to Okay. All right. I, I don't, I don't want to, I want to leave you enough time. Um, all right. So, uh, Robert E. Howard's Sword and Sorcery Tale, Red Nails, published as a three-part serial in Weird Tales in 1936, tells the story of the city of, uh, there's a lot of weird names in this story, and I'm just going to, you know, give them a try. Uh, the city of uh, uh, Chicotli, Chipotle, no, Chicotli, uh, <laughs> the enduring war between the uh, Tecutli and the Zotolanc and the dehumanizing effect of sustained conflict. Um, I think you can go to the next slide. Red Nails uh, engages with several venerable uh, literary patterns or tropes. Uh, one I focus on today I term uh, the uh, stalemate war. Um, by focusing on this trope, I hope to make a case for an under-acknowledged and perhaps surprising facet of uh, the character of Conan, his compassion. Uh, so first let me explain what I mean by, a literary, uh, by the literary trope of the stalemate war. Stalemate war is a literary trope. By literary trope, I mean a commonly associated set of. Um, could, no, please leave it there. Uh, this is normal. Uh, I mean a commonly associated set of plot, plot conventions, recurring motifs, and themes. Tropes can be contrasted against the broader concept of a literary genre, which arguably describes a work as a unified, a cohesive whole. Tropes, on the other hand, can be nested within a work without dominating it thematically. Uh, one of these tropes, the stalemate war, this is a term I'm using, I don't know if somebody has talked about this, um, but it's, I'm, I'm allowed to do that. Uh, one of these tropes, the stalemate war, consists of two, si uh, of two sides locked in a violent, hatred-fueled conflict. At the beginning of the narrative treatment, the originating cause of the conflict is historical and has often been forgotten by both sides. Uh, therefore, the war has become interminable, even absurd. Every si uh, each side's victory conditions have become amorphous. If these victory conditions are articulated, a uh, victory consists quite simply in the complete destruction of the enemy. The war has become one of mutual extermination because reconciliation between the two sides is no longer possible. Uh, the conflict has festered to the extent that both sides have grown to completely dehumanize the other. A key feature of the trope of the stalemate war is that the lives of the combatants and often the societies have become, have become a kind of strange, ahistorical purgatory where nothing happens except death. The stalemate war has a robust presence throughout literary history, and there is not enough space to sufficiently survey this trope, um, but a brief schematic treatment will be helpful before applying it um, to Howard's Red Nails, uh, Chicotli, and the war between the Tecutli and the Zotolanc. Yeah, uh, good. All right. It is, uh, so this is a survey of the, um, the trope of the stalemate war. It is arguable that the stalemate war emerges in literary history with the Trojan War that predicates Homer's epics. Indeed, it can be glimpsed in classical literature, often in the dramatic histories of Greek and Latin historians, um, Herodotus, Tac Tacitus Plutarch, um, the, you know, all these perpetual um, conflicts that are treated um, poetically. The stalemate war carries on into medieval European literature as well. Uh, consider uh, Dante's comedy, which is permeated by allusions to the perpetual struggle between the Guelphs, I'm probably butchering that as well, and the Ghibellines. Uh, Dante's dis uh, dis depiction of the Phlegathon, the river of boiling blood, where the violent and warlike are perpetually tormented by centaurs. Uh, this is a powerful rendering of the stalemate war. Uh, Shakespeare's historical plays are rife with competing poetic treatments of the Hundred Years' War between the, the, the French and the English and so on. Robert E. Howard's Red Nail is a powerful rendering of the uh, Red Nails is a powerful rendering of the Stalemate War. Partly inspired by uh, Howard's visit to Lincoln, New Mexico in 1935, uh, the site of the bloody Lincoln County War, uh, in telling the story of Chicotli, Howard renders the participants of this interminable conflict as insane and obsessed with revenge. Uh, before proceeding uh, to deeper analysis, let me briefly summarize uh, the plot. Um, very. Um, there's a, a probably some, I'm trying not to give too many spoilers. It's still going to be worth reading. My summary does not do justice to the story. So. Uh, the story begins with Valeria, the Red Brotherhood, fleeing enemies. She has struck out in a, into a wasteland in order to escape. She discovers to her annoyance that she has been followed by Conan, who, unbeknownst to her, has helped her escape. As Valeria and Conan are bickering, they are attacked by a monster. Although Valeria and Conan are briefly trapped, uh, they succeed in killing the monster. 
Fearing that more monsters will come, they flee to a city ruin, hoping uh, to find aid. This ruin turns out to be the accursed city of Chicotli, which is a massive network of corridors, towers, chambers, and catacombs. Worse still, in Chicotli, Conan and Valeria become embroiled in a war that has been waging between two factions, the Chicotli and the Zotolanc, for several centuries. The war between the Chicotli and the Zotolanc is particularly gruesome. The Chicotli nail a copper nail into a black pillar for every enemy killed. Accordingly, the Zotolanc take pleasure in beheading their enemies and morbidly preserving their gruesome heads for charnel display. With Conan and Valeria's aid, uh, the Tukutli triumph over the Zotolanc. Alas, after the triumph, they betray Conan and Valeria. The story concludes when the Chikutli are themselves slaughtered when a sin from their past returns. In the end, Conan and Valeria are the only ones left, standed, left standing, surrounded by corpses and the graveyard quiet of a suicided city. The inhabitants of Chikutli are described as insane due to their lack of compassion. Consider Valeria's first glimpse of a member of the Chikutli uh, faction. Uh, quote, she caught the wild eyes among the lank strands of black hair, end quote. Or consider uh, Valeria's observation uh, um, when she meets uh, Tukotl, um, who, who eventually becomes an ally. In his eyes, behind the glow of terror, lurked a weird light she had never seen in the eyes of a man wholly sane. There's a lot of emphasis on the, um, on the eyes of the inhabitants of the city. Or consider uh, Valeria's reflections as she prepares uh, for slumber in the strange city. Uh, these people were neither sane nor normal. She began to doubt if they were even human. Madness smoldered in the eyes of them all. Finally, um, consider when Conan listens to uh, the prince of the, the Chikutli, uh, Omek, as he describes the eternal warfare. This is a longer one. Uh, with his weird eyes blazing, Olmec spoke long of that grisly feud fraught, fought out in silent chambers with dim, in dim halls under the blaze of the green fire jewels, on floors smoldering with flames of hell and splashed with deeper crimson from severed veins. I'll um, fast forward, but it ends with Conan grunting. Uh, and the tortures were so ghastly that even the barbarous uh, Sumerian grunted. So even Conan has been affected by the, the gruesomeness of this, uh, this, this war. Uh, the stalemate war in Chicotle has fully dehumanized the inhabitants of the city. In their shedding of all human compassion, they have lost uh, their very humanity. Uh, Conan and Valeria, in contrast, become defined by their compassion for each other in this story. Uh, before proceeding to substantiate this claim, I know it's weird to say Conan is compassionate. We, don't, we see Frazetta paintings. We don't think of him as a compassionate person. Uh, but let me be clear about the general way I'm using the word compassion. I understand compassion as a natural uh, human sympathy for the sufferings or misfortunes of others, and compassion often results, of course, in taking positive actions to alleviate the suffering. Uh, at the beginning of Red Nails, uh, Conan has followed Valeria into danger. Uh, beca why? Because he empathizes with her decision to become an out outlaw, why she knifed a Stygian officer. Uh, referring to the Stygian and his unwanted advances, Valeria tells Conan, oh, um, you know what my provocation was. Conan responds, if I'd been there, I would have knifed him myself. Uh, the violent topic of their conversation notwithstanding, Conan is showing compassion for Valeria here. He understands her provocation and sought to help. Moreover, uh, when Valeria asks Conan why he trailed her, he responds with a question, haven't I made my admiration for you plain ever since I first saw you? Uh, Valeria answers, um, a stallion could have made it no plainer. <laughs> I love that quote. Uh, although sexual desire for Valeria is indeed a component, um, perhaps central component of Conan's admiration, the narrator is clear to state that her body is not the only thing that Conan values. Consider the scene where Valeria, annoyed by Conan's insistence, insists, insists on helping. Uh, she brandishes a sword and demands that he leave her. Uh, he was angry, yet was amused and filled with admiration for her spirit. He burned with eagerness to seize that splendid figure and crush it in his iron arms. Yet he greatly desired not to hurt the girl uh, going on down. Uh, he had seen Valeria kill too many men in border forays to have any illusions about her. He knew she was quick and ferocious as a tigress. Uh, later, after Conan and Valeria have been attacked by a monster and are resting before proceeding to the ruins of Chicotli, Conan shows compassion for Valeria. He volunteers for the first watch of the night, and when he states, uh, wake me, uh, I'm sorry, when she states, wake me when the moon is at its zenith, like wake me up for a watch myself, uh, Conan um, does not respond. And then her last, this is a quote, her last impression as she sank into slumber was of his muscular figure, immobile as a statue hewn out of bronze, outlined against the low-hanging stars. A Conan, of course, uh, does not wake Valeria and instead watches the whole night. And when she complains the following morning, Conan responds, um, you were tired. Your posterior must have been sore, too, after that long ride. You pirates aren't used to horseback. Later on in the story, after a gruesome battle between the faction, 
Conan's compassion for Valeria becomes clearer by way of contrast to the inhumanity and lack of compassion uh, evident in the triumphant animal-like roaring of the bloody Chukutli. Um, it was not a human cry of triumph. It was a howling of a rabid wolf pack stalking among bodies of its victims. Conan caught Valeria's arm and turned her about. So there's all these people screaming in triumph. They've just murdered all sorts of people. And Conan grabs Valeria and says, you've got a stab uh, in the calf of your leg, he growled. She glanced down, for the first time aware of a stinging in the muscles of her leg. Moments later, in response to the Prince of Chicotle's crowing about bloody triumph, Conan further reveals his compassion. So he, he tells Conan about all the great glory, they've, gore they've, they've, the, um, the battle they just won. Conan responds, you had better see to your wounded, grunted Conan, turning away from the prince. Here, girl, let me see that leg. We are more familiar with Conan as death dealer than a healer, but in this scene, his actions, thrown into relief by the ultra-cruel context of the stalemate war, he is distinguished by his compassion. Indeed, the compassion Conan and Valeria show for each other mark them as human in contrast to the dehumanized inhabitants of Chicotl. Consider Valeria's suspicious observation about the Chicotl healer who bandages her leg. A little while before, Valeria had seen this same woman stab a Zotolanka woman through the breast and stamp the eyeballs out of a wounded Zotolanka woman. Conan's compassion does not only extend to Valeria, who he physically desires and respects um, as a sexual, um, as I say, who physically, I, I, Freudian slip, who sexually desires and, and respects as a warrior. Uh, Conan and Valeria legitimately befriend one member of the Chikutli faction. Uh, his, his name is really confusing because his name is Tukotl, but it's, why didn't he pick something else? You know, you're getting all these mixed up. Uh, um, and through Conan's friendship with him, uh, he seems to redeem this character's lost humanity. As he lays dying, betrayed by his prince, the narrator describes Conan's kindness and compassion um, and how it meant uh, something to this character. Tukotl's groping fingers plucked at Conan's arm. In the cold, loveless, and altogether hideous life of, Chikul, uh, of the Chikutli, his admiration and affection for the invaders of the outer world, that's Valerian Conan, formed a warm human oasis uh, constituted a tie that connected him with a more natural humanity that was totally lacking in his fellows, whose only emotions were hate, lust, and the urge of sadistic cruelty. Almost done. Let's see. Yeah, almost done. I, uh, I, ho ho I hope I'm not trying your patience. Academics read papers out loud. It's not very fun. Uh, okay, so, um, moving on. Okay, uh, Oh, no, go, go, go back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off. Uh, so before concluding, let me briefly detour or to touch on another great literary work that treats the trope of the stalemate war, George Orwell's 1984. Uh, consider the disturbing prophecy of the, uh, of the, uh, the non-future of Oceania, a superstate locked in perpetual war expressed by the, uh, the torturer O'Brien, who would have been at home in Chikutli, I think. His famous speech captures the horrible nature of the stalemate war as a dehumanizing defeat of time and the way that refusing compassion maintains the stalemate. Um, if you've read 1984, O'Brien has been torturing Winston, and, he's, and Winston is about to kind of be broken as a human being. He's about to be dehumanized himself. And O'Brien says, it always makes my hackles raise when, raise when I read this, is, there will be no curiosity, no enjoyment of the process of life. All competing pleasures will be destroyed. But always, always there, there will be the intoxication of power, constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Let me conclude by contrasting this dark image of inhuman dystopia with Howard's answer, resolution even, to the trope of the stalemate war. Red Nails ends with a surprising image, considering its gruesome material, a scene of healing and, aff and affectionate embrace. Surrounded by the dead in the quiet of a city that has suicided, our heroes tend to each other's wounds as both healers and lovers. Uh, you need a bit... It should be, you need a bandage on that leg. Larry ripped a length of silk from a hanging and knotted it around her waist, then tore off smaller strips which she bound efficiently to the barbarian's lacerated limb. I can walk on it, he assured her. Let's be gone. It's dawn outside this infernal city. The old blaze came back in his eyes, and this time she did not resist as uh, he caught her fiercely in his arms. Um, sorry for the transcription errors up there. So when Conan first met Valeria in the wasteland, she held a sword to his heart. Here she is at the end, healing him. By and by, through tenacity, Conan the Compassionate broke the stalemate and ended the war. Thank you.